It would seem natural that players associate what is perhaps one of the most common physical signifiers in a role-playing game, that of rolling a die, as a representation of action. We roll to attack, roll to dodge, and when expressing a desire to act, the common request of the game master is to say, give me a roll. Traditionally, RPGs have often derived information from a character sheet to influence the roll of a die, cementing this notion that the gesture of rolling the die is the abstraction of, for example, swinging a sword. The math behind the scenes is a static formula that takes into account character strengths and weaknesses, but doesn't change or can't be influenced much by the player's choice until leveling up. In many ways, Numenera suggests an opposite direction. It allows players to use the information on their character sheet to actively change the world around them, influencing the difficulty of challenges. This means that the role of the die is somewhat different than we might think of it in other RPGs. In the grand scheme of things, rolling a die means nothing more than rolling a die. It's a function of how we play role-playing games. I'm going to make the case in this video, however, that particularly as it pertains to Numenera and the Cypher system, we can restructure our perspective of the die, placing it as the representation of the unpredictable inner workings of the universe in our games and not as extensions of our characters. It's what comes into effect after considering the strengths and weaknesses of a character. If we focus in on what the cipher system affords Numenera's setting, that of Earth a billion years in the future, we can appreciate how the cipher system's 10 levels of difficulty work. They represent the wild and majestic world outside of the character and serve as a baseline of difficulty for a variety of challenges. The difficulty of scaling a cliffside, for example, is an abstraction of different factors such as the height being climbed, whether there are easy footholds, and perhaps even the surrounding environment, weather, and time of day. Before ever rolling a die, a character's skills and talents, the way they are built, automatically has a direct influence on how hard or easy getting through such a challenge is. And this is before considering the die. If scaling a cliff in the Black Riage represents a difficulty three task, a player who is specialized in climbing and has an asset such as a hook and rope never needs to roll. They succeed at the task. Specialization in a skill such as climbing lowers the difficulty by two, and the hook and rope combo bring it down another level to zero, guaranteeing success. The die only comes into question when there's some uncertainty. A character's strengths may result in the challenge being easier for them, but as long as the difficulty ends up being at least a 1, there's a chance for something that could turn out differently from how the characters expect. In the case of climbing a cliffside the GM rules is a level 3 difficulty, a character who may be specialized in climbing but lacks tools or equipment that could aid in climbing can't guarantee that he, she, or they can make it to the top. There's a chance, and probably a good one, that they can get up there, but without that hook and rope, Who's to say that a patch of loose earth or a slight angle or elevation that a hook and rope would have easily canceled out might present an obstacle that sheer talent and training can't get past? Of course, without that equipment, the player isn't without options. The rules of Numenera, when run with the cipher system, see characters as competent, dynamic objects capable of influencing the world around them without always needing to rely on chance. The rules refer to this as spending effort, where points from an ability pool are spent to make a task easier. Since a character's abilities are represented by a pool of points as opposed to a static number, a character can draw from their strength, speed, and mental acuity to make things easier, but it also means that they have limits. The specialized climber facing a level 3 cliff without equipment can put in a level of effort, pulling points out of their might pool, in order to bring the difficulty down by yet another level, flattening the difficulty out to a zero. They succeed based on their training and a bit of effort and focus, but it costs them a bit of points an abstraction of the available strength they can draw upon for the day. They can use their character build to actively work with these challenges. Let's take a more fantastical example. Alma, a learned nano who never says die, finds herself standing in front of a mysterious gateway of swirling energy positioned between two giant columns of metal and synth. After entering a mysterious crypt of a former world, she finds herself cut off from her party by a rampaging machine intelligence that has deployed fabrications of twisted flesh guided by nanomachines to hunt them down. 
She's barricaded herself in a quiet, featureless room, the swirling gateway dominating the attention by decorating the walls in flashes of brilliant violet light. She's being hunted down by the intelligence's horrific creations, and there isn't much time to act. But she's certain she's seen gateways like this before. She thinks she can find a way out, at least for herself. Saving her party might be another matter. She suspects she could probably escape the crypt by activating this gateway in the right way. The GM tells the player that getting through this the way she wants will be a level 5 difficulty. The character is specialized in understanding Numenera, which reduces the challenge to a level 3 difficulty. The character hears the abominations of nanoparticles and flesh slamming themselves against the door she's on the other side of. Time is of the essence. The player activates a player intrusion, spending a point of XP she has, and tells the GM that in her past, she was trained by a nanomaster who gave her some guidance on manipulating portal entries just like this. The GM accepts this and says that this background will give her an additional asset, bringing the difficulty down to level 2. She can put in a level of effort as well, bringing it down to level 1. Success is not guaranteed, but she can also use a book she has on the Numenera as an asset. The GM tells her, however, that this will take at least 10 minutes, if not more, to flip through the pages to find something helpful. The hostile intelligence's minions are pounding at the door. They could break through at any moment, and there are far too many for her to hold off with just an esoteric or two. She has to make a choice. Does she break out her book and look for a diagram, a paragraph on traveling through time and space, or anything that will drop the final level of difficulty down? The door behind her explodes open. Screaming comes from the twisted throats of more than a dozen mangled forms of flesh. The player rolls the die and describes her character as tearing a panel off the side of one of the metal columns. She jams a series of wires together, and a plume of smoke emerges from the columns as they spit sparks which fall and dance on the floor. The swirling energy shifts in color. Did it work? With the approaching horde, there's no time to second guess it. Her specialization, player intrusion asset, and effort brought this down to a level 1 task. A roll result of at least a 3 will guarantee that she gets through in one piece. It's a 90% chance of success, but something could always go wrong. The player rolls an 8 on the die. 7 lower than the original target number at level 5, but thanks to the character's strengths and talents, it works. Alma finds herself sailing through a blur of energy as she leaps into the gateway, only to wake up on a random beach somewhere. The crying screams of the intelligence's flesh horde are now in the past. She dusts the sand from her clothes, looks out at the waves, and sees a storm is forming far off in the distance. Maybe she can make out a boat far off on the horizon. She's not sure where she is or where the rest of her party is. She takes a moment. Her player makes a recovery roll to restore some points. She exhales and then starts looking for landmarks to see where in the ninth world she's been transported to. During this entire scene, the focus was on the character finding a way out of the challenge based on their skills and talents, not as simply the end result of the gesture of rolling a die, the results of which are boosted by a collage of numbers that go into a single modifier stat that rarely act on the environment. The whole of the character's concept comes together in this pivotal moment, where she rises to the challenge of being an explorer in the ninth world. The d20 came into play when the scene couldn't be resolved by means of the character abilities alone. Her specialization in Numenera, combined with her asset and a bit of her own effort, made the task much easier, but in the end it was still up to chance and fate, albeit a very good chance. The die represents the nuances of physics, chaos, and uncertainty. This nano was very likely to succeed, but a failure on a die could have been the result of her distraction at the sound of the approaching enemy. It could have been the result of the device being just slightly too complex or degraded and old. All of this would be possible with a beginning tier 1 or 2 character. Even without the specialization in understanding Numenera, our hypothetical nano could still lower the difficulty to a 2, which would succeed with a roll of 6 on the die. Her roll of 8 would still have cleared this. This is why I believe it's important to keep the sense of rolling the die as literally tossing oneself into fate or luck. It's what comes at the end of deciding what to do, after considering the strengths and weaknesses of the character in relationship to the challenge. It doesn't represent character action or bind abilities to a random number generator. In Numenera, characters act on their abilities, and sometimes we have to let fate and chance play a role. That's where the d20 comes in. The character's strengths determine how much fate and chance factor into the outcome, but they aren't based on it. Decisions start with what characters are good at, and the system responds to how the characters are built. 
by prioritizing character strengths and abilities, the die represents the fate of the world outside of their control, and they progress in their abilities by diminishing the role that chance plays in their actions. While this pertains to just about any cipher system game, I believe that in the context of Numenera, this brings to life the characters and setting in a way that's not as approachable with other systems. When introducing Numenera to new players, whether they've previously played an RPG or not, I tend to avoid using words like science fiction, science fantasy, and certainly sci-fi. I instead tend to ask players to imagine the world a billion years in the future after the rise and fall of previous civilizations that have left behind powerful mysterious technology. I ask them to imagine that they are a member of a young human civilization in the wake of all of this technological mystery and change, and I ask them to think about who they might be here in this vision of Earth and encourage them to build from there. It is who they decide to be that will determine what they're good at, what they can actively do in the face of challenges, not merely what role they serve in a mechanical sense. It's less of a game of chance and more of a game of active engagement. Concept is not backstory here, it is an active story in the game. This is why I believe that some who are new to the cipher system sometimes struggle with the wording of rules that don't necessarily outline concrete functions. It's not about the rules representing a set of functions that dictate your character's form and function, but rather what you, as a player or GM, can do with the rules to shape the experience you want. The rules and the setting of the Ninth World are offered to players and GMs for considerable interpretation in building an experience, not designated instruction to follow. Since the world responds to characters' strengths and weaknesses, instead of a series of analog quick-time events the players throw dice at, the players and GM engage in a game that shapes the experience through player choice, design, and agency. It is this malleability that keys well into a setting that is diverse, weird, and unexpected. The core of Numenera is mystery and wonder, and to have that running on a system that allows for a dynamic kind of creativity that centers the situation narratively is only a natural fit. In the previous example with Alma, the nano escaping through a portal, her strengths and talents actively lower the difficulty, possibly nearing it to a guaranteed success with the right training, equipment, time, and effort. The entire focus is on who she is as a nano, augmented by the player's decision to actively incorporate backstory into a mechanical advantage through a player intrusion. The crisis of her situation is what forces her to rely on a bit of chance and luck. Because she doesn't have the time to dig through a book on the Numenera to get through this challenge, she has to trust her skills and her instincts. Skills and instincts which are baked into the character design to pass the difficulty challenges. And in Numenera, those skills and instincts chosen by the player for a specific experience matter, starting as soon as Tier 1. I hope what I've demonstrated in this video is that the Cypher system and Numenera encourage players and GMs to think of player ability, talent, and action before considering the dice. This isn't to say that there isn't theater involved in rolling the die, that there aren't thrills from rolling a natural 20, or crushing defeats from rolling a 1. What the system suggests, though, is that play should be based on what the characters are doing with their talents, not how well the math equation on their character sheet matches a predetermined static number. Characters influence their environment and have many options in considering the ways their characters could get around challenges. This means that GMs may have to do a bit of prep work sometimes in anticipating how players may outsmart a challenge, but it means that the work done before the players enter the game considers the strengths and talents of who they are in the first place. The openness of the skills and many of the abilities afforded to players isn't boiled down to a game of arithmetic or rock, paper, scissors, but is instead about interpretation and creativity in applying different strengths and weaknesses to different circumstances. It means that the die is the final step in determining player action, if it's even necessary to begin with. Players ought to consider their character sheets as representing their capacity to act and perform, not merely influence the results of a random number generator like a die. Start with what you're good at and what items are available to you when getting around difficulties, saving die rolls for when chance and uncertainty is unavoidable. GMs should consider this when designing adventures, especially for early adventures and new players. They should encourage players to use their abilities and resources to navigate challenges instead of lobbing dice at everything and hoping for the best. 
Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. The Infinite Construct publishes Numenera content weekly, and there is much, much more to come.